Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, Adapters, welcome back. In this exciting episode, we take a deep dive on climate risk and the insurance sector. Early in the fall, I attended a two-day conference hosted at American University in Washington, D.C. The conference was organized by the Environmental Defense Fund, SBP, and American University. The event brought together experts focusing on the role of insurance in building equity and disaster recovery, reducing future losses, new innovations in expanding coverage, and the role of insurance in managing increasing climate-related disasters. It was a fantastic event, and I got to interview experts representing both the public and private sector. You'll hear the need for insurance companies to conduct climate risk analysis and the role of government in addressing these issues. The insurance sector is increasingly turning its attention to the huge impact climate change is having and will have on its ability to provide coverage. Attendees at this conference are laying the intellectual groundwork on where the insurance industry will need to go. I'd like to thank Dr. Carolyn Kuski and the Environmental Defense Fund for sponsoring this episode. And thanks to SBP and American University again for organizing the conference with EDF. Before we get started, I want to give a heads up on the next Battelle Innovations in Climate Resilience Conference, or ICR24. Battelle is presenting their third annual Innovations in Climate Resilience Conference with the theme Solutions for Scaling Change that captures the urgency and the growing need for innovations at scale to meet the monumental task of addressing climate change. The conference will take place on April 22nd to April 24th, 2024 in Washington, D.C. ICR24 will gather innovators across industry, academia, and government to share and inspire science and technology to move solutions forward. This is the second ICR that I'll be covering for Battelle. We partnered on an episode for ICR 23 in Columbus, Ohio, and I'm excited to announce a continuation of that partnership. Okay, so the call for abstracts is now open. You won't want to miss this and you need to act soon. The themes of the conference are mitigation, sustainability, and yes, adaptation. ICR 24 is your opportunity to join scientists and researchers from academia, industry, and government working at the forefront of climate innovation. The goal is to build a better, more sustainable society for future generations. So here's your chance to share your important work, submit your abstract today, and present with leading experts from around the world in responding to climate change. Visit battelle.org forward slash adapt to submit an abstract and learn more. That's battelle.org forward slash adapt. There are links in my show notes. Support for America Adapts comes from Battelle, where science and technology are applied to help create a safer, healthier, and more resilient world. Okay, let's get this episode started, talking climate risk and the insurance sector. Hey, Adapters. Joining me is Dr. Carolyn Kuski. Carolyn is the Associate Vice President for Economics and Policy at the Environmental Defense Fund. Hi, Carolyn. Welcome back to the podcast. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here chatting with you. We've done quite a few episodes together. I'm very excited about this one because we're going to go somewhere on location, a conference that you're organizing. For those who haven't heard you, can you tell us what you do there at EDF? Yeah, I'm in our economic research team, and a lot of my work focuses broadly on the economic impacts of climate and how we can adapt and build resilience in the face of those risks. But more specifically, I think a lot about the role of insurance in helping us manage increasing climate-related disasters. So let's talk about that. What is this conference? Yeah, this conference, we're calling it the Climate Risk and Insurance Conference. It's jointly hosted by EDF and our partners, SVP and American University. And we have three big themes we're hoping to explore at this event, all at that intersection of climate and insurance. So the first is, how can insurance do a better job of improving equity and recovery from climate-related disasters? The second one is, how can insurance do a better job in not just helping with recovery, but helping actually build resilience for both households and communities? And the third is what we're seeing in the news all the time, the kind of crisis in certain parts of the country as insurers are exiting markets because the risk is going up. So how can we stabilize those markets? So those are our themes, equity, resilience, and stabilizing the markets. Those are some great themes I'm looking forward to attending and learning about all this. But let's talk a little bit about the experts. You don't have to give all the names because there's a ton of speakers, but I guess more broadly, the different sectors that you're planning to have there. Yeah, we're trying to bring together 
not only groups that are in constant conversation with each other about these topics, but groups that might not always be talking to each other. So we, of course, have representatives from the insurance sector, the private sector. We also have a lot of public sector folks, and that ranges from people at federal agencies down to local governments that are struggling with what this means on the ground every day for the people who live in their communities. We have people from different NGOs and nonprofits. We have several researchers coming. So we're really trying to bring a diverse group of people together because some of these challenges, as you know, thinking about climate adaptation really requires people from different sectors and scales all starting to work better together. Helen Wiley was your partner for this. She's with SPP. Why did you partner with her in the design of this conference? Yeah. So actually, the origins of this conference go back a few years to a grant we got from the National Science Foundation through their really neat program called Civic Innovations, which is designed to bring researchers and communities together to solve problems jointly and to be led by the community. And we were part of the original cohort working together with the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice and the Center for New York City Neighborhoods to help think about how to build resilience to escalating flood events for low and moderate income households in that region. And the conference is partially funded by that NSF grant, as well as some very generous corporate sponsors as well, who we should acknowledge. And so in some sense, this is the culmination of that work where we were really thinking about how to innovate on insurance to help achieve social goals. So we've been working together for a couple of years on that effort. All right, Carolyn, I'm going to see you in DC. Very excited to get there. I love the city and I will see you at the conference. Okay, see you there. I'm excited. Hey, Adapters. Joining me is Francis Bouchard. Francis is the Managing Director of Climate at Marsh McLennan. Hi, Francis. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Doug, it's great to be here. I love your show, and it's an honor to be on here. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Well, first off, let's ground some people here. What's Marsh McLennan? Marsh McLennan is a company that has four primary businesses. One is called Marsh, which is the world's largest commercial broker. One is called Guy Carpenter, which is the world's largest reinsurance broker. And then you have Oliver Wyman, which is one of the leading C-suite strategy companies in the country, in the world, actually. And then Mercer, which really is an advisor on finance and health issues. Yeah. And just looking over your LinkedIn and even our own conversations when we've chatted before, you've been involved with so many groups and companies over the years. So it's really amazing, but it's kind of hard to introduce your bio. But so we're going to just skip all of that. And I want to jump into, we're talking about this conference, we're talking about insurance, and you've been in insurance a long time. When did climate risk get on your radar? Actually, quite early in my career in insurance, it was in the mid 90s, and I was working for the Reinsurance Association of America, and I was their chief federal lobbyist at the time. And during the 1996 presidential election, and I doubt you got to vote in that one, Doug, but 92, uh, 92 is my first. I'm all right. Okay. There. All right. there you go. But go uh, on. Well, <laughs> in the 96 re election campaign, Vice President Al Gore actually started quoting my boss at the time, Frank Nutter, the outgoing president of the Reinsurance Association, about the need for the insurance sector to work more closely with the science world to get a grasp and an understanding of what we were then calling global warming. So it's it's not a, a new issue. I'd say it certainly has a new urgency, and it's certainly much more of a, a prevalent issue today. But this goes back at least 30 years from, from my perspective, Doug. All right. So we brought you on to give us that sort of 30,000 foot perspective. And so there's been a lot of turmoil in insurance market these days. And we keep seeing headlines of insurers leaving and concerns about people finding affordable insurance. Can you give us that big picture of what's going on? Well, I mean, there are a lot of things going on and that's what makes it really complex. I mean, clearly there's increased exposure to extreme weather that climate change has some element to for sure. But there's also other dynamics. You have claims inflation, you have regulatory challenges on the pricing side. You have more people continuing to move into high danger areas, exposing higher and higher economic values to extreme weather. So it's really a confluence of a number of factors. And you know, you look at the insurance company's CFD filings, for those who don't know, the Task Force for Climate Financial Disclosures. And most insurance companies are quite direct and, and open about the fact that after their 12-month policies expire, they continuously renew. And if climate begins to 
they put pressure on the profitability of their policies, they will start to increase prices or withdraw capacity. So it's exactly the storyline we've seen the insurance companies predict would be too strong, but suggest may be the future. And I think what you're now starting to see is capital that is moving to other forms of risk. So California wildfire isn't the only risk in the United States. There's not only other geographic risk, but there are other industry risks. There's commercial risk. There's cyber risk, which is becoming a bigger and bigger component of the insurance sector. So the capital tends to go where the profits are. And with all these things happening at the same time, that's what you're seeing. So I, I would actually call this as a little bit more of a certainly a, a risk crisis than an insurance one, because the insurance sector is simply holding a mirror up to society and showing that, hey, these risks are becoming more and more acute. Okay. Speaking of holding that mirror up, you have said in the past that for insurance to stay relevant, insurance needs to engage more in climate risk issues. Can you tell us a bit more about how you think insurance could play a larger role in solving climate challenges? Yeah, I think we have a tendency to, to limit ourselves to one aspect of, of our role, and that's risk transfer. And I think that is going to become much more difficult in the future as the risks if the risks continue to go unabated. And then that's, candidly, it's why I've been listening to your show for a couple of years, because the ideas that people have about different ways to reduce the risk is really needs to be kind of the primary, I think, defensive strategy, maybe is the right word. Meaning we saw in COVID that remarkable steps needed to be taken to flatten the risk curve. And I would argue that we need to do the same thing, not just the insurance sector, but all society in climate. But for the insurance sector in particular, our ability to continue to send risk signals through 12-month insurance contracts is being challenged for a number of reasons. And we need to find other ways to apply our, our knowledge and our expertise on this topic that would help reduce the risk, thereby allow us to continue to insure. And I, I can assure you, having been part of the sector for 25, 30 years. Nobody wants to abandon clients. Nobody wants to pull out of markets. They Companies want to, to do what they do, and that is to provide insurance. And I think the, the next step is the insurance sector needs to find ways to work directly with community and community leaders, community decision makers, who are the ones who are going to somehow pay the police, keep the teachers happy, build the schools, keep the roads plowed and find ways to finance either nature-based or traditional gray infrastructure to protect their citizens, to protect their economy. So it's really a, a dialogue, Doug, that I think I hear referenced a lot on your show and at a lot of conferences I attended. I attend about the need for new partnerships and new ways to find value in different sectors. And for the insurance sector, I think it's an urgent situation and we should be working more and more closely with communities. All right. So bear with me on this question. And so it's my sense that the insurance sector at large is not waiting around. And we, and we see this and you just sort of explain what's kind of happening out there. And they are thinking about climate change and these risks more deeply. So do you think on the other side of that, local and state governments will be able to keep up in these areas? And so you always hear about these insurance companies pulling out, but these states regulate the insurance industry. Will they be able to regulate competently as these new climate risks come online? I mean, it's my sense that they just can't keep up. Well, Doug, I'm not going to say that the regulators are incompetent. Not, okay. not on your side, okay? Right. But, but it, it does reflect a challenge, right? And I think that what the insurance insurer actions are illustrating is that there are uh, growing challenges when it comes to adequately providing risk cover for a risk that is on a clear path to increasing, right? And that there's complexity in it. We used to be able to work with individual policyholders and really incentivize through our contracts, through terms and conditions, including price, behavior that would reduce the risk of that individual policyholder. The, the challenge is that with climate change, these risks are more systemic, so the ability of the insurance sector to influence the type of behaviors that are needed at a, a system level is very difficult to do that through individual insurance policy. So we're going to have to kind of come together here and recognize that brute regulatory force might feel good in the short term because it might slow down some type of market disruptions. But as I think the Florida market can show, 
that can only go so far and it will only work for so long. So I'm more encouraged by some of the, the type of uh, partnerships and research that regulators in the U.S. And, and around the world are undertaking to see what their role should be in helping to reduce the protection gap. So I, I've seen uh, supervisors moving beyond their traditional mandate of a solvency supervision and then access and affordability for citizens. That's been kind of a dual regulatory mandate. That has evolved to be much more about a solutions-oriented mindset I think that's where the dialogue with regulators need to go. And encouragingly, I see more and more regulators seeing that as well. So, so Doug, I think this is going to be one of those, you know, cataclysmic national battles. I think this is too big of an issue for us not to all take a quarter step back and and really figure out a different way to tackle it this time. Staying with that idea of being encouraged, what innovations or changes are you seeing in insurance that make you optimistic? There's a lot of it going on. I mean, some of the tech developments that I see on warning and monitoring of wildfires, pretty wild. Some of the the new approaches to tracking and understanding sea level rise and the impact and visualizing that is really compelling. Yes, but I think there's even some deeper forms of innovation that are even more encouraging. So one that that we are certainly working on and Guy Carpenter, I think, has helped kind of lead the, the path on this along with, well, Carolyn Kuski when she was at the ward and Helen Wiley and others who are part of the conference called community-based catastrophe insurance. And I think it was referenced a few times at the conference itself, but this is where you really draw out the value and the benefits of a highly efficient risk transfer tool like parametric and find a way to insure people who today are not insured for apparel and do that. And that tends to be lower income populations. So there's a way for us to innovate on the, the models we even use, not necessarily the exact you know, terms and conditions of, of policies, but those two are being innovated. But the entire model of actually using group wide risk bearing and risk sharing mechanisms to bring to natural catastrophe or extreme weather, that's a new thing, right? And and we've only done it once, Doug, I admit. We did it in New York last year, but we are having conversations with many organizations and many communities about their risk profiles and their needs for new approaches. And hopefully this community-based catastrophe insurance will be one of those. There's other dialogues that we're part of that are quite exciting as well in terms of trying to find a better way to understand and then translate the risk reduction benefits of nature-based solutions translate those benefits into direct insurance benefits for downstream communities that benefit from it. That's not something we're good at as an industry. We struggle in taking system-wide or system-level risk reduction approaches and reflect those in individual policyholder rates. We're working right now with with a conservation group and a water authority to explore how to do that. And I think if we could monetize the benefit of nature-based solutions, you then have a, a strengthened investment argument for those same type of uh, instruments. So there's a lot of really smart people thinking a lot of creative things out there, Doug. And that's why I think that somewhere in there and the hundred other things that are going on, that's where the solution is going to be, not in a regulatory tussle where we're forcing people to take or not take risks that they're simply not prepared to do. Okay. I just had, I, so this interview is being done after the conference. Any highlights for you? You've talked a, a bit about some of those examples of innovations and in insurance, but some conversations that you had, what stood out for you at the conference? I think what stood out for me at the conference is how Carolyn, Helen, and others could pull together not just a an agenda that was extremely compelling to an insurance professional who's committed to these topics, but could draw in people from a whole slew of other communities. So I like you, Doug, probably, and and other listeners, I go to a fair amount of my conferences and you start to see the same people. And sometimes it feels like you're talking to each other, right? You're just having the same conversation in a different setting. Well, the EDF conference for me, what it really did was expose me to some people I'd never met, some sectors I'd never even talked to before. And I'm out there, Doug, I'm talking to anybody who'll talk to me, right? So for me to still be stumbling across new people and new sectors and new companies and new entities, I found that to be really rewarding and exciting. And it shows you that I think we're at the early stages of some type of coming together where I think you're going to start to see some really creative and impactful partnerships emerge. 
And really, it's the type of events like the EDF conference that bring those parties together and start to show them just how close we are to the same common goals, the same common approaches, and the same common objectives. I mean, everybody wants to retain sustainable insurance markets. The insurance industry, regulators, community activists, health care officials, you name it. And these type of conferences kind of, I think, reinforce that. But if I have one, not criticism, but the observation I would make is we need to stop the just the talking and actually start the acting, right? We need to have more partnerships announced. We need to have more pilots done. We need to be scaling quickly the best ideas out there. And, and we'll get there. And the conferences like the EDF will get us there quicker. But it's time for us to start to focus on impact because we're running out of time otherwise. Fantastic final message. Thank you, Francis, for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate it. Hey, actors. Joining me is Helen Wiley. Helen is the Disaster Preparedness Program Director at SBP. Hi, Helen. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Doug. Thanks so much for having me. First off, what is SBP? And you, can you briefly describe your role there? Yeah. So SBP is a national nonprofit organization that was founded almost two decades ago by Liz McCartney and Zach Rosenberg down in St. Bernard Parish, Louisiana, after Hurricane Katrina. Hence the name of SBP, because it started out as the St. Bernard Project. And the organization really started out as a home rebuild organization. Our founders just saw the complete devastation and how little recovery and rebuilding had started for really left behind families in that area. And so they really sought how can we transform home rebuilding after disasters, do this much more quickly for disaster for survivors, because getting home quickly matters so much as we'll discuss in the insurance context. And so as they scaled and built more and more homes, they really found that there are so many lessons in the disaster space all across the cycle. And so wanting to share the lessons of how to do home rebuilds quickly and build homes more resiliently for other communities was really important. And so the organization today almost two decades later, works all across the U.S., particularly in flood and tornado contexts, but we work on all different natural hazard types. And we work all across the disaster cycle to, you know, help survivors build their homes to higher resiliency standards, prevent as much suffering as possible by preparing and advising communities, and really advocating for more effective federally funded programs and services both before and after disasters. And my role is leading our preparedness program. And I really think it's, you know, the most critical piece of the whole thing is how do we do more pre-disaster rather than post? How do we be less reactive? And pairing disaster preparedness with larger climate resilience efforts is really critical. And so I lead our preparedness program at SBP. And a lot of what I try to do in my work is build in more financial preparedness into how not only households, but community leaders are thinking about what types of actions they can take pre-disaster. So you helped organize this conference. Could you provide some of the background on the history and the objectives of the event? You work closely with Carolyn. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. So Carolyn Kuski and I used to work at the University of Pennsylvania together and we were doing research, really looking at how can we make financial resources more accessible for low-income families more quickly after disaster events. And flood insurance really being a major focus of that, you know, we were looking at what had been happening in the global south with all different types of microinsurance programs, as well as more of meso level programs in the world of, you know, really in those senses for smallholder farmers and, and folks of, you know, linking microcredit and loan programs with microinsurance. But, you know, what would it look like to bring some of these types of concepts into the U.S.? And so in a number of different grant projects and really great partnerships with different cities and states and around the U.S., we started iterating on, okay, you know, if we were to move into different types of insurance models or complementary financial products, what are some of the ways we could get resources to low-income households more quickly? 
also some great complementary work looking at, you know, how to link insurance and, and nature restoration and a number of other things. But we started seeing all these really interesting ideas that, you know, hadn't yet been launched into the public arena, but were being thought about by both private and public stakeholders around the U.S. And it was really exciting, particularly as we got into some projects like this New York City pilot that I'm sure you'll be covering in the podcast. What came together in this big grant project we'd had through the National Science Foundation Civic Innovations Program was doing a workshop eventually at the end of of that project. And so what we really wanted to do after hearing all these great ideas to try to do things differently in this disaster insurance space was have a convening where we bring together all these great minds and ideas and really start to build this larger community of practice for transferring ideas and knowledge across different stakeholders that aren't necessarily already talking with one another. And that just being so important for, you know, all the folks that are in private insurance who are trying to do things differently and have new types of products come to market to really hear, you know, what those in the public sector are trying to do and innovate on, you know, what does and doesn't work with those new types of products. And then vice versa, those in the public sector and and nonprofits who are trying to get money more quickly to low income families, them understand, you know, what are some of the opportunities, but also limitations in the private sphere. And so that was really the impetus for having this convening that we had in the fall. One of the central themes of the conference is improving equity in disaster recovery. So given SBP's work with vulnerable communities, could you share some insights into the challenges you've seen in the current recovery system? Yeah, disaster recovery, you know, it, it's a really broken system in the U.S. and around the world. And and one of the major things that we focus on at SBP, and it's our mission, is how do we shrink the time between disasters and recovery? When you think about equity, delay is one of the biggest issues for low-income families in the U.S. If you have little to no savings, you know, extremely limited access to credit and loans, and don't have insurance, folks try to rely on aid in the U.S. Well, one, there's the misconception because federal disaster assistance is limited and is not intended to be for full recovery, but it often takes a very long time before it reaches the low-income households that are actually able to qualify for it. And folks think that they'll get much more through disaster aid than they do, in fact, And so that's something that we really focus on at SBP. We, for instance, have a FEMA appeals program where we help low-income families appeal their award amounts or appeal if they're denied assistance and absolutely want families to maximize the amount they receive from assistance. But it really is a one-time thing for most households. In any case, though, that delay issue is, is immense. And so what do families do when they don't have access to money immediately post-disaster? Well, you have all kinds of, you know, cascading larger challenges that compound for for low-income families. If you're already, you know, barely able to afford your health insurance or, or don't have health insurance and have major other financial burdens, having a disaster event can really be a tipping point. And so this delay issue and when you receive money matters so much. And so when you think about insurance, it really is the best way to get money quickly to households. And so improving that ability and the equity for those that are more vulnerable and low income to access insurance is really critical. A couple other things I'd say that are important when you think about equity and and disaster recovery challenges is there's a lot of fraud in, in the disaster recovery space. There are a lot of unlicensed contractors out there and just a lot of folks looking to take advantage, unfortunately, of people in a very hard time. So, for instance, when you think about insurance for those that are fortunate to have homeowners or flood insurance There's unfortunately folks that will go into really devastated communities after a disaster and go door to door, you know, offering their services to folks that were impacted and had home damage. 
And they might, if they're particularly an unlicensed contractor, obviously not everyone is out to take advantage of folks, but there's way too often folks making off with people's money without, you know, a firm contract in play. And then so there's a lot of challenges of particularly vulnerable households, older adults being taken advantage of by people in this system. So, you know, this is a little bit more detailed, but for instance, with insurance, there's a reason why when damage amounts go over X threshold that an insurance company has has, they often will, the mortgage holder, so the mortgage company will hold back a portion of the insurance payout to that household if they have homeowner's insurance because they want to prevent a fraud situation where someone could make off with a homeowner's complete insurance payout all at once. And so they might disperse it in two or three amounts so that, you know, if anything were to happen, the homeowner, but also the, you know, mortgage holder, i.e. the is not, you know, out from that amount of money that was going to be covered. FEMA grants are often relied upon by the uninsured, but they can be a challenge to obtain and may not provide enough financial support. And you've talked about this a little bit, but can you elaborate on the difficulties SBP has seen in this regard? FEMA grants are limited, as I was saying. And so the average amount from FEMA's own data is that recipients will typically get about $7,000 in federal assistance versus when you look at the federal flood insurance program, payouts are on average around like 69000 So by no means the same amount. And what happens often with disaster assistance is it's obviously complicated for folks to apply. They're pointed over first, usually to the Small Business Administration to see if they qualify for a loan before they're brought back again to FEMA to, you know, potentially get the aid amount. And, and it's all very confusing as a household member post disaster to understand, you know, what application is where and, and where your information is currently at. There's also complicated things involved with, you know, when your house needs to be evaluated for damage and just huge disparity in often the award amounts you might have based on who is um, the assessor looking at a house. So folks can get very frustrated in a community because you might have two homes with what looks like equivalent damage, but because a different person assessed one house versus another, they are awarded different amounts in part because one family might have done much better documentation of the damage to their homes than the other one. And so what we work on in our FEMA appeals program is to help those that are underawarded their amount for aid to appeal that and, and add in the amount of information that's needed to maximize their award, which our program has seen great success with. And why that's so important is that for most folks that receive disaster assistance through the federal government, unless you then maintain insurance for a like event after having received the aid, you're not going to be able to ever qualify for aid again in the future. So it's really important for folks that are applying for aid to maximize that award amount that first time. So we're at this insurance conference. And why does SBP believe that disaster insurance is a crucial area of focus? And you've, I think you've covered a lot of those bases, but how can it bring benefits to disaster affected communities? I mean, can they be that proactive in helping out? Yeah, so disaster insurance is such a critical piece of the picture because it means that you've taken action pre-event to have coverage if something happens. So just like with your health insurance or car insurance, you know, paying, at least if we're thinking about a traditional insurance premium and, and policy, you know, you're paying a small premium pre-disaster and that gives you X amount of coverage if, you know, an event happens. And it's then much more automatic. Now, of course, you do have claims adjustments and things that can really get complicated, particularly issues on what if damage caused by wind versus water, if you're dealing with homeowners versus flood, which is really confusing for folks. But insurance, you know, when we look at the different financial tools available, is on average much faster in getting money to families than other resources like 
aid, as we were discussing, or again, it you know depends on if people even have access to credit. Which often, low-income families don't, and and very little to no savings. So we need to make insurance more accessible for more folks if we know it is one of the best tools for recovery. And so at SBP, what we really focus on in the preparedness program is, for instance, doing recovery planning in advance. And so that means really extending for families and community leaders what they can think about as being part preparedness planning. So, you know, yes, you need to put together your emergency kit in the home and make an evacuation plan, but preparedness is so much more than that. And so we, for instance, think about recovery planning being a central piece there. And that should really be where you begin your thinking. And so, you know, learning about, okay, well, would my home qualify for disaster aid if a disaster event occurred that had a federally declared disaster declaration? So finding out if someone in that home had received disaster aid in the past, which would then prevent you from getting aid again if if you don't have insurance for a like event. You know, understanding better what types of loans and credit you could access in different types of scenarios. But thinking through budgeting, you know, just more broadly for emergency events is just so important, but of course, really hard for low-income families. So for those that do have more financial tools, we really go through understanding these different financial tools and how to better plan. But then you really think about this most vulnerable population who have really no ability to pay an insurance premium, what's really important is to think about what are some alternatives we could use in the insurance space to get more folks financial protection. And that was really a central aim at this conference is unpacking some of these new types of insurance tools and financial mechanisms that can fill in some of these gaps right now left by the disaster insurance space and other financial products out there. So the conference is over. Any thoughts, any you know, highlights for you? What do you think? Yeah, I think for me, what was just so exciting was seeing particularly in breaks the interaction between different folks at the conference and, and all these people that Carolyn and I had been talking to for the last you know five years or so, all interacting with one another and being excited about a lot of these pilots going on around the country. I moderated a panel that was focused on solutions coming out of the public sector. And what was exciting for me is in conversations between different you know, local government leaders who are trying really hard to bring new types of programs to fruition, which don't necessarily have to be in partnership with, you know, the private sector. There's some good ways you could think about, you know, adding on different types of things to the National Flood Insurance Program through local grants, etc. But hearing them talk with one another and trade lessons learned from some of their initial scoping work was just really exciting for me. I also think that, you know, we haven't talked about my insurance, but there's some great lessons again from the global South and, and some of these micro products that can be brought to the U.S. And so having a few of those ideas highlighted at the conference was exciting for others to hear, I think. All right, Helen, it's a pleasure meeting you. I got to meet you there in person and thank you for coming on the podcast. Thanks so much, Doug, for having me. Hey, Adapters. Joining me is Janelle Kelman. Janelle is a current council member and former mayor of Sausalito and candidate for lieutenant governor in California. Janelle also runs the Center for Sea Rise Solutions. Hi, Janelle. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Doug. Thank you. I am so excited to be on one of my favorite climate podcasts, America Adapts. Thank you for having me. I am very humbled that you are a listener. Thank you. I appreciate it. And we got a chance to meet in person in Washington, right? So we were back in D.C. at a really great event hosted by Carolyn Kowski and her colleagues at EDF. Yeah, that was great. And it, we, we got a chance to chat. Obviously, we didn't get enough time to chat. But here I have you. You're coming on after the conference. This will be a conference episode, but I'm doing interviews with folks after the conference and just learning a bit more about what you do. So I want to start this off by just focusing on the work that you're doing for the Center for Sea Rise Solutions. You have started this nonprofit to help identify solutions around sea level rise and flood risk. So what led you to start this group? So yeah, great question. And I am really, really excited to have the opportunity to talk about it. So I live in Sausalito, California. As you mentioned, I serve on the city council. I was the mayor last year. 
But my background is I'm an environmental lawyer, turned entrepreneur, turned local elected official. And I've lived in Sausalito since 2001. And I served about 10 years on the planning commission, kind of off and on, and got engaged about uh, four or five years ago on what's called our general plan. It's a 25-year planning document for communities in, in the state of California. And as we were digging in, we realized that this plan, which hadn't been updated in 25 years, didn't have very much in the way of sustainability, disaster preparedness, resilience, and almost nothing on sea level rise. We're a bayfront community. We, we sit on the water. I'm looking out on the water right now as I talk to you. And we experience flooding frequently with greater intensity. And I thought, well, what, what's going on? Who's, who's addressing this? Who's in charge here of these rising waters? And I asked around and, and the county was doing a lot of good preliminary work, but we really hadn't dug in as a community. And so as I was running for public office and I had the opportunity, it was actually during COVID, to talk with people and really get to hear their stories, I talked to them about the risk of flooding and disaster preparedness and disaster preparedness in terms of you could have a wildfire on one side and flooding on the other. What do we do? And I realized it was a real need to tackle this issue in our community. So I also realized it wasn't just an issue for Sausalito, it was an issue around the world. And so I wanted to develop a platform to be able to communicate with other leaders in the United States. And so I launched the Center for Sea Rise Solutions, and we began to travel around the United States talking with other elected officials and other key decision makers about what actions they were able to take. We very quickly scaled that. We've done a significant amount of work globally as well. We were at the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon. So we've done work in Portugal, in Italy, as well, a significant amount of work in France, both in Paris and Biarritz. And it turns out we're, we're all struggling with very similar issues and really can learn from one another. That sounds really ambitious. What are some of the specific big things you want to accomplish with the group? What we really want to do is break down silos. So if something is, is happening or being learned in a particular community, it shouldn't get lost or kept within that community. How do we make sure that even some of the more, more basic items, which unfortunately are kind of hard to draft sometimes, like a, an update to a planning code or a zoning ordinance or drafting a quest for a proposal for an expert consultant to help develop some type of vulnerability assessment. We want to make sure that if a community has taken the time to draft and develop that type of material, that it can get shared beyond their jurisdictional boundaries. And so that's a big part of this is to develop a clearinghouse of information, connect key individuals working on these issues around the country, around the world, make sure we're all learning from one another. The other aspect of this is we are very oriented towards action. There are a lot of important commitments being made. There's a lot of great planning that's happening, but we want to make sure we go that extra mile. We help people actually take action towards some types of coastal adaptation or, or measure that improves the resilience of their community. You were the former mayor of Sausalito, and now you're a current council member. Tell us a bit more about Sausalito. You'd mentioned it's a coastal town, but can you give us a bit more detail about it? Maybe, I guess, population, and then maybe dig into some of the climate risks. Absolutely. Well, I would just tell you, I absolutely love Sausalito. California is an incredible place to live and breathe and enjoy. And Sausalito is the first town immediately over the Golden Gate Bridge. If you're in San Francisco, you cross the bridge and then you enter really quite a paradise. We're a hillside community. And so you'll see homes cascading down a very steep hillside and then flat land that then abuts the bay. This is called Richardson Bay, which is, of course, distinct from the coastline. So we're not actually on the Pacific Ocean, which is important when it comes to a different regulatory environment. But it's about 7,000 permanent residents on the weekends. We can have as many as thirty to 40,000 visitors because it's such a beautiful place. Lots of cycling and running and water sports, beautiful views of the city and Oakland from here. It's just a tremendous place to, to participate in as a resident in terms of the natural beauty. But there's also a, a real vibe and commitment around climate work and making sure that we are climate leaders. And so being an elected official is a real honor because I get to help lead the community to become more climate resilient. Well, I imagine it's north of San Francisco and it's right there on the water. So I'm sure real estate is very reasonable, right? Uh, well, you know, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> We've had people who've lived here for a very long time. And so while their, their home value has gone up, they've actually enjoyed being here at a time when it was a sort of a small suburban outpost, if you will. So it's really developed, but everybody I know is so proud to be a member of the Sausalito community and the Marin County community because it is a, a motivated, smart, forward-thinking community. 
Okay, so I've talked to a lot of local government people that do adaptation planning, nonprofits that do it. And even when a community is really being proactive around it, it a lot of it's insider stuff. You know, the, this planner knows it. They go to the conferences and they want to do these things, but the public has no clue that they're doing it. And the public isn't necessarily demanding it. What do the people of Sausalito think about all that? I think you're spot on. I think community engagement is the hardest lift and the, and the most difficult aspect of climate resilience to, to do effectively because you want transparency. You want to make sure that you're hearing from all stakeholders and that you're getting feedback and buy-in from your community. And it can be really difficult to make sure that there's full participation. One of the things that I try to do, I try to put out a, a newsletter before every council meeting. I try to interact as much as possible with members of the community to explain to them, here's what I know. I want you to know exactly what I know. I don't want to have any uh, special information. If I know it, you should know it. And then we can make decisions together because it's truly my job to represent the interests of the community. And so you need to make sure you're on the same page. It's a big part of climate resilience for us. Something like flooding can be a little bit difficult in a, a hillside community because I think the, the original or initial inclination can be that, oh, I'm not going to flood because I live on a hill. And that's that's quite true, right? You won't actually flood. But if you like running water, if you like electricity, you have to acknowledge that many of those key components, those key pieces of infrastructure are in the flat areas that will be prone to flooding. And so it's a way to connect it and make it more meaningful so people understand that full ecosystem of how it can impact them. The other piece of it for Sausalito is while we have the Golden Gate National Recreation Area to the west of us and the bay to the right, there's really only one road in and out of Sausalito. There's some smaller roads that come up off the highway, but the main road in and out is in that flat area. And if that you know started to experience flooding from storm surge, high tide, sidents, sea level rise, a confluence of factors, it can be really, really dangerous for us in the long run. So we wanted to be proactive and, and take the opportunity. And I did it by developing a sea level rise task force bring that information to the public. We have a, a website on the city website all about sea level rise, what we've done, what other communities have done, just to share as much information as we possibly can. We were both at this insurance conference. You have been doing some work with the insurance sector. Give us some background on that. Yeah. So as I'm, I keep mentioning, you know, we're a hillside community. And so we have flooding in the flat areas, but we also have landslides. And in 2019, the community experienced a very serious landslide that was primarily the result of oversaturation of soils through frequent rain events. And through, again, this confluence of factors, a massive portion of the hillside came down. It took out many homes, took out a whole valley in, in the community. And it was really very, very dangerous and very expensive. And I thought, you know, the traditional insurance market isn't going to be able to keep pace with climate risk. And I, you know, I didn't make that up. That's what we're hearing from the insurance industry. We're seeing in the state of California, insurers are pu pulling out because of wildfires and other reasons. And so I started to really drill in and think about well, what are some new products that might apply to our community, things that we might be able to use to help enhance our coverage that pulls the community in, but is really specific to this idea of climate risk. And so I began to dig into what we talked about at the conference that parametric insurance concept, the idea that you could have a data-driven trigger, so let's say like a rainfall amount, that if that rainfall amount were to be hit according to the agreed-upon sensors and data collectors, that there would be a payout for the community. And so that's something that we're, we're digging into here in Sausalito. It's also called community-based catastrophic insurance. It's being piloted right now in New York, and I'm hoping that Salito is the next pilot. All right, let's continue on that. With the conference, did anything stand out? Because that New York one, I know about that. Part of what's happening in the insurance industry is that they're trying to be innovative because of the emerging risk with climate change. What are some of the things that stood out at the conference for you? What did you learn? One of the things I learned, and you may remember this, I, I looked out to the crowd. I was on a panel and we were talking about these pilots. We we're talking about parametric insurance. And I said, okay, we have everybody in this room to take action. Why don't we all you know, gather after this panel and let's sign up 10, 15, 20 communities? I didn't get that 15, 10, 20 communities to sign up because even though there's a lot of great uh, ideation around this, there's still a little bit of uncertainty about how you actually move it forward. Who would administer 
this type of parametric insurance? Is it held by residents? Is it held by the jurisdiction? Where's the source of data? How do you agree on that data? Is the payout high enough to really help companies? And so, you know, that was one big aspect of, of my learnings there is that there's a lot of momentum and motivation, but still a little bit of trepidation about how we, we take action. The other thing that I learned, and this was, uh, I was really happy to, to feel this camaraderie in the room, is that there seemed to be a real agreement and consensus that we need to consider the massive impact that climate change is having on increasing the frequency and severity of extreme weather events. And the conversation, as you may recall, is that this you know, intensity and, and severity coupled with non-existent or outdated building codes or outdated flood maps and lack of data is, is creating a growing insurance protection gap. And that means our communities are left with massive bills to pay when disaster strikes. And so the outcome of that consensus is that there was an agreement in the room that we need to consider new insurance products and we need to implement pilots now. I'm still learning a lot about the insurance industry and that the conference was fantastic that way. And being from Florida, it, there's such a dysfunctional situation with insurance. And I'm always like, oh, well, the insurance companies just pull out. You know, it's going to be the free market sort of determining that we're no longer going to insure these high at risk places. But then when state governments come in and how they regulate insurance companies, they can't be as nimble as and maybe as innovative as they want to be. So it just gets so complicated quickly. Right. That, that's true. And it gets complicated But it's also complicated because what we're trying to do with these new insurance products like CBCI is we want to link mitigation and risk transfer so that we can help residents, we can help municipal budgets, and we can really halt the trend of insurers who are pulling away from certain perils or areas of the country. And that linking of mitigation and risk transfer requires a lot of deep diving and data analysis. I mean, it can be very controversial. And there are these attempts to help low income people get access to flood insurance and and products like that. But in certain areas and being a council member, these must be the tough decisions for you is that high income, low income, there are areas that people shouldn't live. And what's a responsible government entity? What role should they play in there? And it comes off as that they're just pricing out low income people. But at the end of the day, some of these areas, no one should live. And it seems like there's efforts to just, okay, let's get them insurance products that allow them to stay where they are at, which can be dangerous areas. Yeah, it is a tough decision-making process, and they're not all the same, right? If you are in a low-lying area that is significantly below sea level rise and there's really very few adaptative measures you can take, you have to consider, you know, what are my long-term, what's the long-term viability of living here? Which I think is different than what we often look at here in Sausalito of landslide risk. You know, what is the risk of a landslide? What is the risk of an earthquake? We have a number of different perils that Californians have to familiarize themselves with, unfortunately. And and it is that, that opportunity to say, okay, can I mitigate this risk? What does it mean to mitigate the risk? And how long can I adapt? I like to think about it as like a systems approach to resiliency you know, can we use adaptive nature-based solutions, which may also have biodiversity benefits? Can we include insurers in infrastructure planning from the start? And then can we also have some type of financial incentive for homeowners or cities who invest in this type of risk reduction? And you're in a unique area. I'm, I'm from the East originally and just, you know, one flooding areas, one in 100 year floods, it's different than being sort of a mountainous right next to coastal. And so it's just so much more expansive of the areas that are at risk. So it's complicated. All right. Yeah, super complicated. is a unique place with these unique risks, but what advice would you give other local governments to be proactive in managing general climate risk? It, well, I think engaging your community, understanding what your community is concerned about, and talking with your with your other elected leaders or other just doesn't have to be elected leaders, other leaders in your region. I think one of the biggest opportunities for the state of California is more regional planning. And even though we, we see that often mentioned in the news across different types of climate risk, it, we're still getting a little bit held up on what it means to be regional because multi-jurisdictional or inter-jurisdictional type of planning can be very complicated. I can tell you what we might do in Sausalito, but I can't tell what, what my neighboring jurisdiction might or can or should do. And so developing those types of uh, relationships and consensus building on a regional basis backed up by the best available science that the community understands and is educated on, I think is the, is the best path forward. Because I, I often um, tell this anecdote, I read this article a couple of years ago now in Scientific America, 
And it was a study from some Stanford researchers. And they showed that if you put a seawall up in San Jose, it could cause flooding in the Napa River. Those two cities are like 300 miles apart, 200 miles apart. So to think about the hydrologic connections and then start planning is, is really where the opportunity is. You'd mentioned you're an ultra marathoner runner. What's yes. the longest distance you've ever run? Oh, I love this question. The longest I've ever run is 66 miles. No, I have not done a 100 miler, mostly because I really like to sleep. And I don't think I would be that effective, but uh, I have done a couple of 50 milers. The Grand Canyon Rim to Rim to Rim is a 50 miler. I did it a couple of years ago and then we just did it again in May. But for those of you who want to go run the Grand Canyon, the portion from Cottonwood campground up to the North Rim was closed. So we only got to do only got to do a 50K, which is 30 miles. I love being an ultra runner. I'm a, I'm a lifelong athlete. I played two sports in college. I was a competitive cyclist for a long time. I, my connection with being outdoors and the environment is, is deep and strong. Janelle, it's been a treat hosting you. Any final words before we sign off? I, I'm going to take the opportunity to uh, give you one word. It's ikigai. I'd love to mention Ikigai, the Japanese philosophy of finding your sense of purpose. And I mention it because I know that when we talk about climate crisis and the climate emergency, there can be a lot of anxiety. And for those of you listening, I just want to tell you, I take a lot of comfort in finding my Ikigai, my sense of purpose in doing this type of work. And I would just urge you to, to also find that shared sense of purpose and to deliver curiosity instead of anxiety and see the things we can do and accomplish together. Well, thanks again for coming on. My pleasure. My honor. Hey, Adapters. I'm back, and I'm with... Rob Moore of the Natural Resources Defense Council. Okay, Rob, we know each other. You've been on the podcast before. You've partnered with me. Why are you here at this insurance conference? This is a really important venue, simply because the intersection of climate change, the effects of climate change on homeowners and renters, and insurance are all colliding right now. And you see this in these big disruptions to people's lives and housing markets because of that. Hurricane Ian came ashore in Florida last year. Prior to that hurricane coming ashore, I believe nine insurance companies had gone bankrupt. After that storm, a number of others did. In California, you have major insurers who are curtailing or pulling out of, of that state because of wildfire risk. These things are all raising the price of housing, making it more and more difficult for people to figure out where they're going to live and how they're going to continue living there. And it's really bringing to the forefront how climate change isn't just directly impacting people through the disasters that are being caused, but it's also having a huge impact on the financial hardship that people are feeling too. All right, Rob, this isn't necessarily your typical crowd, though. So what are your thoughts? There's a lot of really deep in the insurance industry type folks. I'm learning a ton. What's standing out for you in that respect? So one of the exciting things that's happening here is, is we're hearing about a lot of ideas and innovation from the private insurance sector. You know, how can they better engage on this? And there's, I think there's been several speakers here that have essentially admitted that the private insurance sector is really behind the curve in many ways in addressing the impacts of climate change, how it affects their customers, and how it's going to affect their business model going forward. I'm really optimistic that from what I'm hearing here that there, there could be a new level of engagement from the insurance industry in things like building codes, zoning ordinances. You know, how do you get those types of insurance industry, finance industry people weighing in in these types of decisions where groups like the home builders and realtors have perhaps stymied progress towards building safer, better sighted and affordable homes. Okay, so you're part of a panel and you're giving a presentation. Give us a preview. What are you going to be talking about? I'll be talking about some, some ideas NRDC has for directly financing buyouts of flood-prone homes through the National Flood Insurance Program or some other source of, of revenue, basically pre-approving people for a buyout because they know this is not a safe place to live. Maybe they've been flooded multiple times. Maybe they're simply very aware of how flood risks are increasing, and they are either ready to leave now or they know they'll be ready to leave in the future. So how do we make those transactions much easier, more widely available. Yeah, just easier for people to get because we've got millions of people just in the coastal areas who are going to see their homes inundated by sea level rise between now and the end of the century. We have no mechanisms in place 
for assisting that relocation effort and that migration. And we have even fewer mechanisms in place that can do that in an equitable or timely fashion. We recently partnered on a buyout episode, and part of the examples were some of the local governments working on these buyout programs. Do you see a role for large insurance companies in that conversation? You know, quite possibly, but I think buyouts are going to be largely government-led, not private sector-led. They're, they're simply, for government agencies, whether it's FEMA because of their interest in the National Flood Insurance Program or local or state governments who see the value of helping people relocate both for the, the good of their citizenry, but also for their own financial interests. You know, the fewer people that live in disaster-prone areas, the less damage that occurs, the less hardship and suffering that's inflicted on their own residents, those are all net benefits for government entities. For private insurers, unfortunately, they have the luxury of simply dropping coverage. They can just drop coverage and walk away. So buying out a home of a policyholder, there's no profit margin in there for them. So you've met a lot of people here. What are you taking back? Are you going to be doing any follow-up? Are these the kind of people that you want to potentially partner with? I'm really interested in seeing if there's a way to partner with some of the private insurance sector folks on these issues around improving building standards and the criteria for siting infrastructure, for siting homes, making sure that we're making climate-informed decisions. You know, it's, it's very frustrating to see the efforts that are going forward on climate resilience and climate adaptation around the country on the one hand. And then in the other hand, you see governments continuing to dig a deeper and deeper hole. We're continuing to kind of fall behind the curve despite our best efforts. All right. Thanks for coming on, Rob. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Doug. I'm glad you're here. Hey, Adapters, I'm with Theodora Macris, Program Manager at the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. Okay, so what do you do there? I am a program manager. The organization itself focuses on protecting affordable home ownership in the city of New York. We also have partners in all of New York State. My job is to develop the Flood Recovery Fund, which is an emergency grants program that provides aid to eligible homeowners whose houses were affected by severe rainfall flooding. So I'm working in-house with our programs team and our digital products team to get this program up and running. So what brings you to this risk and insurance conference? Yeah, our partners, EDF, SBP, have put on this conference to really bring together all the experts on insurance and risk transfer to talk about the sort of situation we find ourselves in with respect to a changing climate and the changing insurance industry as a result. And I was fortunate enough to be invited here to speak on the Flood Recovery Fund and get to meet experts in the field of disaster recovery to see how we can knowledge share and and bring some of these ideas to fruition. So you gave this presentation and you're doing some innovative work with this pilot program. Let's talk a little bit about that. What is that? In kind of a 30,000 foot level, what is that pilot program? Sure. So it's really kind of based on this parametric flood policy, which is different than traditional indemnity insurance. Parametric says that your compensation is based on an observable measure of the hazard, not your individual loss. So in practice, this would mean we are focusing on rainfall flooding. If a certain amount of rain falls in New York City over a course of time, that may trigger a payout depending on if it's a qualified event. Our organization, the center, is acting as an aggregator in this model, and we are, in fact, the insured. So if a qualified event happens during our coverage period, we'll receive money from our insurance company, which we will then disperse to eligible homeowners in the form of a an emergency grant quickly and without restriction so that these homeowners can you know, start to recover more quickly than they might if they were waiting for federal aid or other types of sort of disaster financing that take months, sometimes years to arrive at the home. So we're really trying to shrink that recovery gap, particularly in low income communities where climate events really act as these economic shocks that affect the household in both the short and the long term. 
Okay, so I think one of the most important things here is the timing of that. But let's go down to that home level. There is a rain event, and someone has, and I'm trying to visualize, there's flooding of their basement, there's flooding of their home. How do they even know you're out there? How does that process work where they can even apply for these funds? So the center really relies on our partnership with housing counselors and legal service providers who work directly with clients in the city of New York on all things sort of housing related. And so we are holding a series of trainings for these counselors to be trained up on the program, what the eligibility criteria are, the limited documentation requirements that we're asking for, so that inevitably when disaster strikes, they are already on the front lines working in their own sort of emergency response way. And the flood recovery fund is essentially sort of baked into their existing emergency response plans. And so we're really relying on these relationships to act as referral services. The center also has what's called our homeowner hub, which is essentially a call center for folks to call and get information about all things homeowner related. And so an applicant can also come to the application through calling our organization and and asking what services are available. So the moment they apply for these funds, what's the quickest they could actually receive a check from you? You know, we're still trying to fine tune the timing of it. We say a couple of weeks. We haven't necessarily been able to test that theory because there hasn't been a qualified event, but we're really, really trying to shorten this gap that we see happening, you know, with FEMA and the Red Cross aid and even through your own, you know, flood insurance policies. So, you know, we say a matter of weeks and and we're really hoping that we stick to that goal for ourselves and, of course, to help homeowners. So you mentioned that you're actually applying for the funds. Someone gives you the funding when these events happen. How long does that take for you to get the funds from the people that are funding you? So, you know, we still go through a claims process. And so we have to submit a claim to the insurance company. They look at the satellite data to tell us whether or not this qualified event has occurred. If it does, those funds are delivered to the center in a matter of days. So much quicker than, you know, your own indemnity insurance policy would provide. The center is up to 30 days to request that data, essentially submit that claim. So that's sort of like the timeline that we're, we're thinking about and that we're looking at. Okay, so what's the amount that you have access to? Because you obviously don't have unlimited funds. That's right. So the payout from the insurance company is proportional to the severity of the flood event. In the most catastrophic scenario, we could receive up to $1.1 million in payout. The kind of lower end, the least severe scenario would yield a $100,000 payout from our insurance company. That's great. You have access to that money. It's probably not enough. If it's a big enough event, you're actually looking for other potential funders for this pilot program, right? That's right. So we were able to purchase this policy through a grant from the National Science Foundation focused on innovative solutions. And so we had capital for the first year. And yes, we are starting to fundraise now for year two premium so we can keep this program going. That's great. seems like a really interesting, innovative program. And that window of getting money out to people is so important. I've been doing some episodes on buyouts and such, and that gap can just destroy people. So that's exciting that you're even exploring that. Okay, I'm going to pivot here a little bit. We're at this conference. What stood out for you? I mean, for me personally, working in program development at my nonprofit, I tend to sort of feel really pigeonholed and in my day to day. And so it's wonderful to come to a conference like this where there are people from the federal government, the private industry, other sort of philanthropic organizations. And so it's really inspiring to be able to kind of take a step back and see all of the players who are working in this space. You know, I find it interesting that we're all coming at it from different angles and it kind of you know, for me, puts a lot of pieces into perspective because I'm still getting into this work myself. And so I'm still learning who the key players are and what their role is and how, you know, certain fields and industries complement each other. And so that's kind of been my biggest takeaway is just taking a step back and and really kind of appreciating the scope and the magnitude of, of what we're all here to do. Do you think you've actually developed some potential partnerships from some of the people you've met here? I think so. Yeah. You know, there's an interesting organization, Raincoat. They're, you know, a provider of these types of sort of parametric products in Puerto Rico. I was fortunate enough to sit on a panel, discuss that along with the Flood Recovery Fund. And so, I mean, hopefully there's a partnership there and, you know, just strengthening the existing relationships that we have with EDF and SBP. Uh, yeah, I, I see a lot of opportunity here. Okay, so if people want to learn more about what you guys are doing, what should they do? 
you should look up the Center for New York City Neighborhoods and see the work that we're doing in the sort of homeowner space in New York and New York State. You could also head to floodhelpny.org, which is a website that we run in conjunction with the city of New York that brings real-time flood risk information directly to consumers. You can type in your address, look up your flood risk, and learn about ways to potentially lower your flood insurance premium and do other you know, retrofits to your home as well. And so I would start there. And you could always look me up too. I'm always interested to connect with people in this field and see what other work can be done. I'll have links to your website on the show notes for this webpage so people can find it there. Last question. What recommendation if someone's traveling to New York for a restaurant would you give them? Think I'm going to give you a moment here to think about it. Oh, yeah. Okay. This is an excellent question. I feel like I could spend an hour talking about this. There is a delicious Szechuan restaurant in my neighborhood called Kings County Imperial. Delicious food, very affordable, beautiful interiors. And the weight's not usually not too bad. So I would say if you're going to come to Brooklyn, you can go to Kings County Imperial. They have a delicious menu for you to check out. Okay, I'm intrigued now. Give me one dish now that I'm thinking about it. They have this like appetizer. It's like a massive plate of oyster mushrooms that are like fried and battered. And it has this like delicious sauce that comes with it on the side. They also, it's not on their menu, but they always have soup dumplings as an appetizer. So I would always say those are, you know, you can't go wrong with those two options. All right. If I come up to New York for podcasts, I'm visiting that. Excellent. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Hey, Adapters. Joining me is Kate Stilwell. Kate is the president of Parametric Insurance at Neptune Flood. Hi, Kate. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Doug. Pleasure to be on. Thanks for having me. And let's get started with the company you founded that provides parametric earthquake insurance. First off, what is that? Parametric insurance is reimagining what insurance can be for the experience of the consumer. It balances the playing field between the insurance company and the insured person. And this is how it works. In advance, you agree on what the lump sum of money is and the circumstances under which it's going to be dispersed from the insurance company to the person. So there's no claims adjusters, no arbitration. It's just a very clean transaction, this lump sum of money in these circumstances. So the way Jumpstart works, Jumpstart is the company I founded, is a pre-agreed lump sum of ten or $20,000 upon occurrence of a major earthquake at your location for you to use however you want, whether you have damage or not, there's going to be disruption and you're going to have extra expenses as a result of a major earthquake, whether that's a disrupted commute, whether that's closed workspaces, whether that's damage to your home, but it wouldn't necessarily have to be damage to your home. There's nobody looking over your shoulder. You just get this money and use it for anything you need. I didn't even realize how diverse insurance could be. What got you started on this journey? I guess getting you to jumpstart and doing what you're doing now. Oh, thanks for asking. So my first career is as a structural engineer, working with architects to design the skeletons of buildings and help keep them safe in earthquakes. So I ended up learning a lot about the mechanics of earthquakes, how they affect our built environment. And then when Hurricane Katrina struck in 2005, I had this pit in my stomach realizing, oh my gosh, safe infrastructure is so important, but it's not enough when there are other missing pieces of disaster recovery, because that's the overarching theme of making people safe in disasters, right? Disaster recovery. Some of those missing pieces are good governance, social connectedness, getting to know your neighbors, but a big missing piece, particularly for floods, earthquakes, and the really big disasters, is getting enough money flowing in. So that's the next theme of the next stage of my career. How do we open the tap, so to speak, on getting more private money flowing as economic stimulus at the time when everybody needs money for something related to the disaster? And if it isn't obvious, you're based in California. You're doing earthquake insurance, right? Correct. So let's talk about your experience there at Jumpstart. And why is it getting you thinking about climate risk? It's earthquake risk seems much different than climate risk, but obviously you're getting involved with both. Yeah, fair question. When we launched Jumpstart, first round of customers, they were like, wow, this is a cool idea. I've never realized that insurance can be as simple as this and as transparent and without as much arbitration. But why are you doing it only for earthquakes? Why aren't you doing it for wildfires? Why aren't you doing it for floods? And I would laugh and say, one step at a time. First, we have to transform insurance. Then we can get to the other perils. As a person with domain knowledge, I had to start where my knowledge was. And I couldn't walk into Lloyd's of London or the California Department of Insurance 
and say, let's do parametric insurance for consumers, because in, by many accounts, Jumpstart was the first to do so in the developed world. If I said it for flood or for wildfire, which I didn't at that time have any domain knowledge, I would have been laughed out the door. But I walk in and say, talk about earthquakes. And they say, okay, let's think about this because you I actually know something about earthquakes. You have the experience and the chops to demonstrate it. I want to go on just a little tangent really quickly because I'm fascinated. I've never lived anywhere where earthquakes were a major issue. And you think about climate risks and sea level rise, and we've always dealt with flooding and we've dealt with wildfire. But when people are thinking about earthquakes, there's this sort of notion of like you live in Florida, you, there's a good chance you might get hit by a hurricane at some point. Do people who get earthquake insurance in their head, even though I know they're being responsible by getting that insurance, is there this thinking that, of course, you're going to get hit by an earthquake or is it more rare? Is it just something people don't think necessarily is going to happen, if that makes sense? Earthquakes as a peril have been excluded from regular homeowners insurance since 1994-ish. And there was a crisis of insurability for homeowners insurance in from 1994 to 1996 after the 1994 Northridge earthquake, just like there is now a crisis of affordability of regular homeowners insurance related to wildfire. It was at that point that earthquake insurance got siphoned off and in California got organized into the California Earthquake Authority, which is not the only provider of earthquake insurance, but one of the providers of earthquake insurance. So this context of earthquakes being excluded. So floods like earthquakes have been excluded since before any of us on listening can remember, maybe in the 1950s or 1960s sometime. The commonality in terms of insurability is that insurers have a hard time putting these major catastrophes into the same actuarial bucket as the regular theft, liability, onesie twosie fires that the homeowner's insurance is meant to cover. Wildfires is an interesting question and problem because Insurance companies have been lobbying, let's say that word lightly, for wildfires to be excluded from coverage in the same way that earthquakes and floods are, because it's just so, it breaks their models of being able to account for them in, in appropriate pricing. So far, those efforts have gone unheeded by regulators, and for good reason, because wildfires are really top of mind. You know, you asked, are earthquakes really top of mind for somebody in Florida? No, not at all. And so it makes sense that earthquakes are excluded from their regular coverage because they're just so rare. But wildfires are just not that rare because every season, people across the country, not just the Californians and Oregon, Oregonians and Coloradoans are smelling the fires that are in their backyard, but people in Minnesota and Washington, D.C. and New York, they're seeing smoke-filled skies. And so it's really top of mind. And so it's from the the perception of frequency and consumer protection, it's in the insurance regulator's interest to work with the insurance companies and figure out a way to keep fire of any kind, including wildfire, in as a covered peril in the policy. All right. Great. That was fascinating. All right. We're going to pivot a little bit here. And so you've been thinking about other types of models. And one of those is community embedded insurance. Can you tell us how those work? Oh, yeah. Thanks for asking. This is really my pet project right now. Within Neptune Flood, you know, you introduced me as uh, being uh, president of parametric insurance at Neptune Flood. But Neptune acquired Jumpstart and we still operate Jumpstart within Neptune as the company. And so within Neptune, we are finding ways to apply parametric insurance, both for earthquakes, but also for floods in ways that are meaningful and that are a win-win-win for the insurance industry, for the recipient, the beneficiaries of the money, and for the climate. One of the sort of front runners for these solutions is community-based insurance. And the idea is that there is an organizing entity Maybe it's a municipality, maybe it's a nonprofit, maybe it's a house of worship who has stakeholders or beneficiaries or constituents that they serve. And they want those beneficiaries to be able to be resilient in the face of a natural disaster. And one of the spokes, one of the dimensions of resilience is having enough economic stimulus, having enough liquidity, having enough money in your bank account to be able to tide you over and make it to the next thing and in a dis disrupted society. So it's in the interest of society, it's in the interest of these organizations to be able to have some liquid funds, some contingent capital, let's call it, to be able to disperse to their beneficiaries. And so how do we set up a parametric insurance product that is organized or administered by these organizing entities for the benefit of their constituents or their beneficiaries? And so there's a fascinating example of this that 
maybe you've already spoken to the Center for New York City Neighborhoods that have set up a community-based insurance product for flood risk. And we're exploring how to bring community-based insurance to communities for a combination of risks, not just earthquake, but floods and wildfires, so that the insurance money is tapped, the deep pockets of insurance can be tapped into at a low per yearly cost to be able to leverage those funds to then deploy them. So for example, a food bank might say, okay, we want to be able to disperse $400 per person to each of the people who comes to our food bank. So we're going to set up a, and we have a thousand people who come to our food bank. So 400 times a thousand, $400,000. We need $400,000 at the time of the next major atmospheric river, for example. And so we're going to set up this policy with the insurance company that we might, for $400,000, we might pay $20,000 per year, but actually it's in society's interest. And, you know, the community foundation is going to pitch in 10000 of that $20,000. And so we're only on the hook for $10,000 a year to be able to bring $400,000 to our beneficiaries at the time of the next big disaster. Wow. <laughs> That's great. And so you were able to lead a panel that was talking about this issue, right? I know you can't go into too much detail, but can you give us some highlights of that panel? Anything that sort of stood out for you? Yeah, I think that one of the behests of the panelists at this event last week was get more projects out there. You know, done is better than perfect. And the more projects that we have that demonstrate the utility of, of community-based insurance and of these solutions, the more standardized they can become and the more people we can help and the more adaptable our whole society can be in the face of these disasters. All right. So I understand you are involved in another startup around wildfire data to help with the ongoing challenge in California with insurers leaving because of the growing risk of wildfires. Could you tell us about that effort? Yeah. Thanks for asking. One of the things that we've learned as more and more wildfires have happened is that a fully mitigated home has a 40% more likely chance of surviving a wildfire, even if the wildfire comes through the community. What the full mitigation means is things like, is the firewood out from under your deck? Is the five-foot zone around the perimeter of your house cleared of dead vegetation? Are the vents up into your attic space covered with mesh? Very simple things that a lot of people can do in themselves or at a very low cost. And the premise is, if the home mitigation makes such a difference in preserving the homes, then that should be reflected in the insurance rates. And so the California Department of Insurance, following the lead of the Nevada Department of Insurance, established criteria, mitigation standards, upon which then the admitted insurance carriers need to offer mitigation discounts. Well, this caused, as you probably have seen in the news, this caused a massive crisis in insurability. A lot of the brand name insurers stopped writing new coverage, stopped making new coverage available to new customers, only servicing their current customers. And rates have skyrocketed, leaving hundreds of thousands of people per year with the insurer of last resort, which is the California Fair Plan. In principle, this works, but in practice, the insurance carriers don't have the on-the-ground details of whether or not the people have done and continue to do these mitigating efforts, these simple efforts. And so the new startup, which is called Firebreak, because the idea is, you know, get yourself, build yourself a firebreak around your house, is filling that gap by providing an inspection app for individual residents to self-inspect their conditions, get advice on mitigation, tap into insurance should they wish, or just stop with the mitigation, and have an ongoing basis of providing that data stream to be able to identify and verify who has mitigated and who has not. Even before insurance companies use this data stream for mitigation discounts, it's still useful for residents to be able to do the actions that it takes to make their home more survivable for the fire. Let's talk about the conference again, though. What were your thoughts? What were some highlights? What did you get out of the conference? Here are some of my favorite comments. Marion McFadden from HUD, one of the higher ups in, in HUD, almost a direct quote here. The insurance industry is rent seeking, but this is a good thing because it means that we'll have willing partners for community based solutions. And that just made my day because <laughs> it acknowledged the reality of the private market and some of the incentives and motivations of the private market, but also recognized that that actually opens the door to be able to meet the needs of the people who need it most. 
Here's one of my favorite quotes that I heard at the conference. So this is Zach Rosenberg, the executive director of SBP. The best policy for equitable housing is to keep low-income people in the homes they already own and prevent them from losing those homes to investors immediately after a disaster. That's so smart. Of course. And so it begs the question, do we believe as a guiding principle for disaster recovery that having safe homes and keeping safe homes is a basic human right? And could that be a rallying cry for all of us involved in this industry? Yeah, great quote. I want to thank you for coming on the podcast and sharing your expertise. Thanks again. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Doug. Hey, Adapters. Joining me is Doug Heller. Doug is the Director of Insurance at the Consumer Federation of America. Hi, Doug. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. All right. I'm not going to make any lame jokes about us having the same name. So we're going to just jump right in. Much as we want to joke. (laughs) I I just didn't have anything. So what is the Consumer Federation of America? Well, we're a nonprofit organization based in D.C. I'm based in California, but the organization is based in D.C. And we've been around since 1968. We do research, advocacy, and education on consumer protection and consumer rights issues. A range of issues from financial services that consumers have to buy to product safety and food safety. I focus on the insurance market and particularly the home and auto insurance. But we also look at other parts of the insurance market, including life insurance and even some some of the insurance that businesses have to buy. Yeah, I went to your website and you guys do cover a lot of ground. It's great resources there. But let's just jump into the, some of the things that we learned at the conference. We heard at the conference that insurance can be really essential to people's recovery from climate disasters. And yet so many consumers are struggling right now with finding a policy. Why is that? It's true. Insurance is really important. I mean, I, I think of it as a really unique. And the reason I've spent 25 years working on insurance issues, affordability and availability is because it's such a critical piece of both financial stability, but also economic security and resilience. You know, for most people, when it comes to their homes, if they own their home, it's the most significant asset they have. It's the source of any, of most of the wealth that most of us have. And so if a catastrophe comes and destroys that, and we don't have any backstop to pick up the pieces, you know, we're really lost financially and and it can really change people's lives. So having that protection is so important. And that's why insurance really is much as we all are frustrated paying our premiums every month, why it is such an important part of our lives. And what's happening, and this is a combination of things that are going on, but the one that's so critically important, I think that brings you to the conference is the fact that climate change is increasing our global exposure to risk that there will be a a loss of property. And what's happening is we have this private insurance sector that serves consumers with this protection, and they're making corporate choices that make insurance less available, certainly less affordable. And that's really not just hitting the pocketbooks of people, but really making this critical tool less available. And that changes the dynamics of home ownership. And also, I think it, it leaves people really worrying about their future. We've also been hearing how difficult it can be for insurance to profitably provide disaster insurance given these growing climate risks. So what solutions have you been exploring? Yeah. So I think that that's a, I mean, it's an important point. I Fundamentally, I don't disagree <laughs> with the insurance companies. I've, I've battled with insurance companies for all my career, but I don't disagree with some of the claims that we're hearing from the insurance industry belatedly because we've been asking them to think about climate change for much longer than they've actually started doing it. But the reality is we are seeing risk exposure, you know, because of climate related disasters growing quite dramatically. And by the way, not just on the coasts, which was how the conversation has been going, you know, where the conversation has been going around insurance that it's, you know, this is about the Gulf Coast and then the, the wildfire regions in the West. In fact, we are seeing dramatic increase in climate risk that impacts property insurance across the country, whether it's, you know, the flooding in Vermont or the derechos that hit the Midwest plain states with these terrible winds that go for hundreds of miles. In fact, the billion dollar storms and disasters that we've had in 2023 were mostly convective wind storms in the kind of Southwest and central United States. Texas has had the most billion dollar insurance losses this year of any place in the country. And so we're seeing this as a national problem. And we have to be thinking about that in a national way. But we also have to be thinking about it 
kind of in a multidisciplinary way. So this is not just a climate change issue. It's also a land use and a housing policy issue. And then, of course, the thing that I'm focused on, it's an insurance and insurance regulation issue. But then there's another piece of it related to insurance, which is reinsurance. And this is a critically important part of it that I think a lot of people just don't know about for because who would care to know about reinsurance? This is the, this is the insurance product that insurance companies buy to protect themselves. But unlike the home insurance that people around the country go to, which is sold by, you know, typically by domestic companies that are regulated to a greater or less degree, depending on the state, but they're, they're regulated by each state. These reinsurance companies are global unregulated firms. A lot of them based in Bermuda, others in Switzerland and Germany that aren't particularly interested in the, the United States. They're interested in finding a return on capital and they'll cha- they'll go around the world for that. And the problem is that reinsurance, that, that backstop for insurance companies, when that becomes so expensive, it has this kind of domino effect that's really damaging our insurance markets. There are a couple of, so to go back to your question, there are a couple of solutions that we're talking about. The first and foremost has got to be working to continue our work to diminish the impact of climate change. I mean, obviously, starting point has to be how are we, how are we changing the direction of our economy so it's not producing worse and worse storms? That's number one. Right there with it is how are we investing in protection up front? How are we mitigating the losses and developing better resiliency in the wake of these climate disasters. Because either we're going to put public money and private money into protecting homes and businesses from the damage of climate change, or we're going to have to come up with money to pay for those disasters afterwards with you know the FEMA emergency relief. So I would much rather, and I think most people would rather spend money on protection and prevention rather than be picking up the pieces and dealing with lost lives because we didn't do the front end investment. So that's the other, that's the second piece. And then the third piece of that, that we're really talking about and we're seeing a growing attention on is fixing that reinsurance market that I just was talking about. We need to address the fact that unregulated global reinsurance companies are not going to save our insurance markets or, and, and they're not going to look out for them. We need to do some of that ourselves. And when, 9-11 9-11 happened and the, and terrorism screwed up property insurance markets for big buildings. The federal government came in and said, hey, we're going to offer a public reinsurance program as a backstop to make sure that Wall Street, I, I mean, literally Wall Street, those buildings on Wall Street could get insurance. Well, we have a crisis of, of epic proportions with climate change and Congress should get involved and back up Main Street just like it backed up Wall Street 20 years ago. So those are some of the, the kinds of solutions, addressing climate change, strengthening our resilience and mitigation to protect against damage when the storms hit. And third, building a public reinsurance system that will help sustain, stabilize and protect the insurance market that we all rely on in order to make sure that coverage can be available and quality coverage at that. And that's a really important kind of piece. So you shared some Senate testimony that you gave, and I thought it was fascinating. You had a long version and then a short version. And in that testimony, you talk about insurance companies providing insurance in at-risk areas and been doing it for years, and now they're pulling back. But then you noted they resisted calls for doing climate risk analysis for a long time. When should they have done that risk analysis? And I mean, I, I find myself sometimes defending insurance companies. Yeah. It's just like, okay, well, they're doing it now. Sort of making that point that they were being irresponsible for a while. How did that history kind of unfold? Yeah, well, I mean, my colleague, and I, I'm going to call him out because he really deserves credit. My colleague, Bernie Birnbaum, who runs the Center for Economic Justice, wrote to the National Association of Insurance Commissioners back in 2005, this very clear, short email to the, all the insurance commissioners who kind of gathered together several times a year with insurance industry and consumer groups to talk about what's needed and the market and regulation. And he said, in 2005, we need to start working on the impact of climate change on property insurance, or else we're going to be paying for it in terrible ways in some years to come. And that just was, and the regulators at the behest of insurance companies who didn't want to do this, they just ignored that. And they ignored it for years. And there were some states that were doing more early on. And there were a few insurers, mostly European insurers, who were kind of developing some thinking around climate change. But most of the homeowners insurance companies in America just ignored that call you know, going on almost 20 years ago. And in the meantime, what did they do? They went to neighborhoods all around the country and said, 
buy our insurance. We've got ads on TV. We're spending, you know, probably between us $5 billion a year trying to convince you to buy insurance from us and bundle your product. And we're writing policy saying it is okay to live in this community or that community on that hillside or in this floodplain or this low lying area. So the insurance companies who we trust and expect to have the most significant and clear headed understanding of risk, they said, it's fine to live there and we'll take your premiums. Thank you very much. And then suddenly this year, really, the insurance industry decided that climate change is real and the risk is too much for us. We're taking our chips off the table and going home. And that's just not, that's not a fair deal because they were the experts who said it was okay. I understand that it's, and I, I'm, I'm glad that insurance companies are using all of that base of knowledge to help make decisions. But right now, but you can't just, well, let me say it differently. You can't just turn on a dime uh, from people and communities who have been relying on you and paying you for decades and say, sorry, we're done. We want to keep our profits here. It's actually, it brings me, and I'm sorry if I'm sort of jumping a thought here, but it's a really important point to me, I think, anyway. Because, you know, these insurance companies are sudden, are being allowed to suddenly just walk away from communities or jack up prices so high that they're effectively ignore walking away from communities, that they can be allowed to do that so quickly means that essentially they are stepping in the role of making land use and housing policy for the country. Because we haven't done a good job of coordinating land use, building code, you know, policy, building codes or housing policy generally. The insurance companies, through their underwriting decisions and their rating practices, they're the ones who are making it for us. And I just think that we have to do a better job as public policymakers at, at sort of addressing the intersection of climate change, land use, and insurance, rather than just outsourcing to the private insurance sector and letting them make all those decisions for us. Okay, so you totally jumped the gun on my next question, and I was going to quote you on that whole notion of like insurance companies making land use decisions, and I thought that was very provocative, and it, it was a great quote, and obviously very true. But then the kind of thing that came to my mind, and I'm from Florida originally, I live in Tucson right now, but I'm from Florida and Florida is, you know, just ground zero for, I guess, California is too. But local and state government officials are not making these tough decisions. And you'd mentioned that the insurance companies, obviously, they lobby and they were there not helping that process. But Florida sort of had this knowledge anyway, Mm -hmm. and they're still encouraging growth really close to coastal areas, even though insurance companies for years now, not just this year, for years have tried to get out of those markets and the state regulators make it hard. From, a, I guess, a free market perspective, the insurance companies are trying to get out of these at-risk markets and yet new growth is coming in. I mean, it shouldn't be these local officials that are the ones that have to be the most responsible here? So the answer, I think the answer, of course, is that every level of government and communities do have to take responsibility for making these land use decisions. But Before I get into that, let me just kind of rewind for a second, because there's some interesting dynamics going on in the insurance marketplace, which make the debate, I think, a little more uh, nuanced than the insurance industry wants it to be. And then then I think a lot of the politicians have allowed it to be. And, you know, you point, you talked, you just mentioned Florida and California, and there's two very different states, even though they're both experiencing similar things, you know, in, in California, there's been a lot of news about big companies like State Farm and Allstate and farmers reducing the amount of policies they're selling in various ways. And there's been announcement after announcement in Florida of companies pulling out of that market. But one of the things, you know, California has had some of the best regulatory consumer protections in America for decades. And what's interesting about California, and it's really important because California has been so central in this discussion. And of course, we all know there's the wildfire risk. We had a terrible, and I'm I'm based in California, we had a terrible a series of wildfire years in 2017 and 2018. Now, a lot of the cost of that was picked up by our state utilities because they were deemed liable for causing the fires. But the insurers, they they did have a tough year those years. They lost a lot of money because that's what insurance does. It covers when when the bad things happen. But since 2018, homeowners insurance companies in California have been more profitable here in this state than just about any other state in the country, even though suddenly they're all walking away. And I think the point and the reason that that's important, I mean, and the reason that we've been so profitable for these insurance companies in California is because the regulator allowed them to increase rates because we've invested about two plus billion dollars 
in good fire prevention rather than focusing on, well, when the fire starts, we're ready to suppress it. We've been really investing in avoiding wildfires. And, you know, of course, there's been some good luck with the wind blew the right way and not the wrong way. But the reality is, even with profitable markets. The insurance companies are kind of using their power to make those decisions about land use and housing policy as a way to get what they want. So in California, they've been pushing for and maybe getting some loosening of regulations. In Florida, they got Governor DeSantis to hold a special uh, session last year that weakened consumers' rights to sue insurance companies for cheating uh, them on claims handling. And so the insurance companies are using the moment, not just to, to be responsible about the impacts of climate change, but to get more profitability onto their books at the expense of consumers who are getting less protection from the industry. So I say that because I think it's really important to have a full context. Now, to the fundamental question, which is who should be responsible? I mean, I understand that these private insurance companies, they have shareholders or private interests. They're going to do what's good for them. And so we should not be relying on them. We should expect them to do at least in part, some of what they're doing in terms of you know choosing whether or not they want to serve in a market. And But we have to be better about it. And when I say we, I mean, those people who are making public policy decisions have got to take this seriously. And it doesn't mean we should be bucking to their demands or just sort of letting the insurance industry threaten us into doing what they want. There needs to be a real discussion about land use. We have to face that. And the insurance industry should be partners with us because they have the data. They should be more involved. Instead, they're just doing what's good for them. And I get that. That's just the way they operate it. But we, if that's going to be the way it is, let's not rely on them and let's take that job on ourselves. And unfortunately, I think it's tough politics to do land use and housing. And, and it's not just, well, we should all move away from the coast or we should move away from rivers. We have social and economic policy and uh, that has you know, made move people into dangerous places, typically because they're too poor to live, uh, you know, in the places that are safer, or because of history of redlining. So we've got, there are kind of a number of issues that are all wrapped up and tangled up in here. And we got to work on untangling them and, and moving together. The conference, you participated in a panel, and I'm going to read it here, Escalating Climate Risk and Insurance Markets. Just briefly, just give some of your thoughts about the conference overall, and I guess some of the conversations and what stood out for you. First of all, I just want to congratulate Environmental Defense Fund for putting together a real, and, and American University for putting together a really, I think, important conference. One that's doing this bringing together of kind of various, I guess what we call stakeholders in public policy circles, you know, to talk about these, the intersection of these issues. So I really appreciate that. And, you know, with our panel, we talked about some of the ways in which public sector has to be paying attention to this issue. It's not going to be solved by the market alone. And, you know, a lot of the conference talked about kind of innovative tools and different, different kind of insurance strategies for providing coverage where we're having trouble or where there are gaps. And that's important for the market to be responsive. And there may be places where we could see, you know, innovative products. But I also fundamentally think, and this was the opportunity that, that this conference created, we have to be engaging the government because this product insurance is much more like a utility than a pure market product, you know, that, that really is a free market product. In free markets, consumers, you know, demand is going to be much more elastic in homeowners insurance markets. And for that matter, business insurance, because if you have a loan, you're required to buy this coverage. And so when you have a situation like that, we know that the market can't solve everything. And so that means that public policymakers have to engage and think about what role government can play. So this conference created an opportunity for players in the market, advocates like myself, people with a perspective on climate change and climate risk, as well as admit people from the administration and just government, uh, local and state governments, we're all there talking about this. And that's a critical step that we have to take and we have to do more of it. Okay, Doug, it's been a pleasure. That's a lot of information and it's a complex issue. And I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Doug. Hey, Adapters, we're back and I've got Carolyn Kuski coming back on post summit. And just so you know, a lot of those interviews I just did happened after the summit. We didn't have a lot of time to do interviews on site. And so I did a lot of those interviews after the fact. And that's what I'm doing with Carolyn here. And we're going to talk about what happened there. So Carolyn, let's do a wrap up. 
Yeah, that sounds great. I'm very happy <laughs> about how things went. I think there were some really interesting conversations and lessons learned. I remember back, Doug, when we were talking before the conference, we were discussing how we were bringing different types of people together and hoping that that might spark some new insights. And that at least happened for me. I thought maybe I'd share one with you, if if you don't mind. <laughs> See if it caught your ears too. Sure. Yeah. So one thing that came up, because you know, I'm sure you've been talking with some of the other guests we talked about beforehand that one of the themes was thinking about how insurance can drive more resilience. And one concept that's been talked about and had been on my mind even before the event was, can't we use insurance to give people more money to build back better after a disaster? And I still think there's some untapped potential there. But what really caught me was that came up during the conference and someone from one of the community organizations that was participating said, you know, we had something like that and we had what's called a fortified endorsement. It gave us some more money to put on a fortified roof, but I couldn't find a roofer who would do it. And if you go to rebuild and you can't find someone who knows what the fortified standard is or how to build to it, then of course it doesn't matter that you actually have the funds to do it, right? And it just really struck for me this concept that we need to build an entire ecosystem and culture around resilience. You can't have one piece without all the others coming together. So one of the things that we talked about even before the conference is innovations in the insurance industry. And you wanted to highlight this at the conference. Tell us about that. What were some examples of that? Yeah. So we talked about how this conference was actually a culmination of some of the work we've been doing in New York City, exploring the possibilities of community-based insurance. And we got to hear from others at the event, too, who are also thinking about some interesting innovations ranging from... Canadian insurers helping conserve wetlands with Ducks Unlimited to thinking about how to embed micro insurance products in government programs or in other types of purchases to whether we can use insurance to deal with extreme heat that taxes our health system. So there was a lot of interesting ideas out there, I think. When you designed this conference, you had all these people in mind and you showed up and it was just like a who's who of people in the industry. But once you were there, did you sense that anyone was potentially missing that you didn't really think about at the time when you were designing the conference? That's a really interesting question. I think what really struck me was how the community thinking around insurance has grown so much just in the past few years. And I've been thinking about disaster insurance for like over 15 years now. And at the beginning I of kind of my career after I got my graduate degree, I felt like I was pretty isolated from the rest of the climate world. And now the two are just so deeply connected. And I think that that's a really important change and shift in how we're thinking about this. And it's going to help enable us to make better use of insurance as a tool when we're thinking about some of our climate challenges. So that's not a direct answer to your question, except to say that I think we could have grown the room a lot because of this increasing overlap. Some of the people I interviewed for this episode, what stood out for me is I can't believe that I find myself like siding with the insurance companies all the time. But when it comes to thinking about climate risk and being proactive, but people that I interviewed, they just felt like folks in the insurance industry need to be a lot more proactive around climate risk. And I thought that was really interesting. I'm like, oh, I thought they were doing quite a bit. Would you agree with them? I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I think there's a lot of untapped potential right now. And I think some of it is around some of the things we've been talking about, new insurance models to help fill gaps that we see right now, like particularly among lower income households and communities that simply can't afford the type of insurance coverage that's available. And yet they need it the most because they don't have access to other sources of funding for their recovery. So I think that there's more innovation and that the sector could help lead in developing some of that. I also think that they could do more in helping promote this idea of risk reduction, which we've been talking about. And I think that's going to be really fundamental because in some of the areas where we're starting to see concern about insurance costing too much and insurers leaving are, you know, part of what's driving that is just fundamentally higher risk levels. And so we all, including insurers, need to be doing more to dramatically change where and how we're building in order to maintain that insurability. I'm in the camp that when I go to these conferences, I actually find the coffee breaks and the lunch is the most valuable time. So did anything concrete come out of this conference since it was held? Yeah, good question. And it's hard to track because you have all these 
folks coming together and then scattering right into different parts of the universe, as it were. But I was really excited just the other day, Doug, because I got an email from someone who'd been at the conference who said that she'd had a follow up with three different other participants in the conference and that they were collaborating on thinking about some new pilots and some new approaches for dealing with climate risks. And so that made me really excited that maybe some new connections have been made that can spin off into some steps forward. Excellent. The Biden administration just released a national resilience framework, and I think you were there in person, right? Yeah, I was. So have you had a time to digest that? It, it, has insurance come up in this national broad effort at resilience? Yeah, there's a chapter that thinks about finance and insurance. And I really applaud the administration getting this out and getting us started in the important national conversation and having a national framework for adaptation and resilience. I think that's really essential. The challenge with insurance is that the federal levers are not that strong because it is regulated state by state. And so I think there's some important steps that the federal government can take. And certainly there's a lot they can do with our flood insurance program, right? Because that's federal. And I know you've talked to guests about that program before, but I still think it's important to have the leadership and the convening power and the kind of pressure for insurers to do more around thinking about climate risk and disclosing about climate risk. Related to that, and I was thinking about this conference and, all right, certain people were invited and people from the insurance industry were there, but the insurance sector is much larger and they have massive conferences. And I was thinking, all right, this kind of information needs to get out more broadly to the broader insurance universe. Is there any efforts to do that? Are people talking about doing that? And, or do you sense that they're doing that on their own and they're going to have sessions at these much bigger conferences? How does that work? Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think it's absolutely true. And it's the same thing about some of these innovations. Small pilots are interesting and, you know, one firm doing something is is helpful, but we really need to scale all of this. And I think that's exactly right. One way that can help take place in insurance is through the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, which is a national group that brings together the regulators across the state. And so that's focused on the regulation, not necessarily the firms, but I think that's one place where you can start to reach a bunch of different markets. But I think you're exactly right. These conversations need to be coming up across the industry. What's next for you? And I want you to just Talk to my listeners if there's an opportunity for them to learn about what's going on here through insurance and climate risk and what's EDF planning to do. Just, yeah, what some final thoughts on it all. Yeah, and I would love to connect with anyone who is thinking about these things. I'm hoping to continue to do more work on all three of the themes that came up in the conference. So the first was that theme of equity and we just have really good research evidence now that the lack of insurance can be a driver of ever widening inequality post disaster. And so I think we really need to do more work to help build that social safety net that insurance can be in the face of disasters for folks who are currently left out of that. And I think that that's going to need to take place at all scales from communities to changes in state regulation to changes in federal policy. And so I'd be really excited to keep working with partners on how we make some of those reforms happen. The second one is about doing more with risk reduction. And I'm really excited to think about things like climate endorsements on insurance policies and how insurers could partner with community organizations to help not just provide the funding to build more resiliently, but to get households the technical knowledge and the expertise and the guidance on what to do and how to do it and how to find a contractor they can trust and a fair price. Because they need, when you're kind of scaling down to the household, people really need help with all of that because a post-disaster situation is not a time when households are going to be researching all that for themselves, right? And so I think there's some new partnerships that could really help there. And then we're doing some hard thinking about what's going on in some of these climate stressed markets like Louisiana, like Florida, and what the role of the public sector insurers should be in those locations. Because what we're seeing right now is that when the private sector pulls out and stops offering coverage, that leaves the risk either on the state programs or on households who are uninsured. And both of those are not the best places to bear that risk. We know that it can be very damaging long-term for households to have to go through a climate disaster without the financing and funds that they need. And similarly, some of these state programs are at higher fiscal risk as their policies balloon. So a lot of tough questions that we're thinking about and excited to keep digging in. 
All right, Carolyn, it's always a pleasure working with you. Thank you for inviting America DAPS to cover the conference and partnering with me. And yes, let's just keep this conversation going. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Love talking to you too and listening to all your episodes. Hey, Adapters, that is a wrap. Thanks to everyone who participated in this episode. As you heard, there are quite a few people focusing on what should come next as the insurance industry grapples with climate change. As Carolyn and I discussed, there's still a lot of work to be done to get a broader spectrum of this industry thinking about climate change. At the end of the day, though, the costs associated with climate change will make it impossible to ignore if you're going to continue functioning as a profitable industry. Lots of changes and innovations, I'm sure, will come in the years ahead, and we heard a sampling of those from my guests. There are quite a few links in my show notes if you want to learn more and some of my guests shared writing that they've done to go into more detail. Again, I'd like to thank Dr. Carolyn Kuski and the Environmental Defense Fund for generously sponsoring this episode. And thanks again to SBP and American University for co-organizing the conference with EDF. I'd also like to thank Francis Bouchard and his wife for hosting me and others at a pre-conference dinner. Thanks for the invite, Francis, and a chance to chat with more attendees from the event. And don't forget to submit an abstract for ICR24 in Washington, D.C. next April. Links to the Innovations and Climate Resilience Conference are in my show notes. Also, and I say this every episode, reach out, send me an email, tell me a favorite episode, recommend a guest, and definitely share how the podcast benefits what you do. That's extremely helpful as I plan these podcasts. And seriously, it's a highlight of my week hearing from you, and sometimes it leads to actual partnerships. I'm at americadapts at gmail.com. Send me an email. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.